Just start it now for people joining. Uh, so welcome to a unique Unity Guide webinar with our special guest, Brian McDonald. My name is Clayton Stenson. I'll be the host today. Uh, I've been in the solar solopreneur coaching consulting space for over three years now, and I've been on a journey to learn how to do what Brian is going to share about today. And when I initially started my business, I struggled to find the clients that I needed. And I remember the battle to keep my mindset right because I didn't want to be a salesman. I wanted to help people. And at one point I was feeling like I was being too salesy in my interactions and I really didn't like it. And I'm fortunate that I discovered through various books and trainings, a way that worked for me, a way to sell and be able to sleep at night, uh, a way that resonated with who I am and who I wanted to be. And then I stumbled upon Brian a couple of months ago, and I was truly impressed with Brian's approach to sales and sales coaching. It resonated with my approach so closely that I suggested that we collaborate on a couple of webinars to share our messages. And the first webinar is today, and it's designed to help you in the area of sales and networking. And our second webinar is going to be on November 29th at the same time. Brian will host, and I'll, I'll be the guest speaker. And we'll be speaking about the visionary second-in-command relationship, uh, which is a coaching specialty of mine. The topic will be frustration to fulfillment, what to do when your visionary doesn't know there's a problem in your relationship. And it's designed to add value to the second-in-command who's struggling a bit with their relationship with their visionary. And I'll drop the link in the chat for anyone who would like to attend that and feel free to share it if you think it would add value to anyone. So, but enough about that, let's let's get into today's content. Uh, by way of introduction, Brian's a partner at On Purpose Growth, where they serve entrepreneurs who have an ambitious yearly or multi-year revenue goal. Uh, his clients have a long track record of success by applying his philosophies practices and strategies to guide them in their sales journey. So welcome, Brian. I'm excited. For yeah, this. thank you, Clayton. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate everybody taking time uh, today. This is going to be fun. Uh, I uh, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, my heart's beaten. My uh, my hands are uh, are sweating. And I don't know if anybody here has been in a sales situation where that's happened. I don't know about you, but you know, I get nervous and, you know, nervous is okay uh, for, for you because uh, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves in regards to uh, sales. So uh, I've been serving people who develop some skill, love or expertise of something in corporate America uh, who decided to make a jump to entrepreneurship. And now they're utilizing that skill to serve small and medium sized business owners. So uh, you know, the problem we face is that uh, we have to sell to survive, yet we don't see ourselves as salespeople. <laughs> so not being a salesperson is actually an advantage to you. Uh, the best sales tactics are non-sales tactics. Uh, like Clayton said, a natural approach to sales is the best approach that you can take. Being more of you and being more of who you are, because people are going to buy you first before they buy the thing that you sell. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what do you, Brian, what do you think keeps people in this space from being confident in sales? So uh, what I've known to be true is that there's a correlation of clarity, confidence, and action. What I mean by that is the level of clarity that you have is directly proportionate to the level of confidence and the level of confidence that you have is directly proportionate to the results your act, your act, the actions you take create or the lack thereof the, uh, the actions you take, right? So for instance, the more clear you are uh, on something, the more confident you are, uh, and the more confident you are, the, the better the results you take from your actions and or you actually start taking actions. So what I found to be true is that a lot of times when I'm moving through the world, specifically in sales, 
when I'm not producing the results that I'm looking for, or I'm not in action, it's because I'm not confident about what I'm doing. And when I take a look at my confidence, I realize that the reason why I'm not confident is I'm not clear about uh, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and how I'm doing it. So slowing down to speed up is is a is a great strategy to use. I know your brain's probably going to tell you, no, you know, don't slow down, do more, more, more. And what I found to be true is that the opposite happens. I should do less, and I should actually uh, uh, figure out how to get clear because then I'll be confident and, and my actions will produce the results I'm looking for. Like for instance, there was a client once where she came to a session and uh, she was just upset things weren't working out for her. So she was trying to do uh, a lot of stuff uh, and, it, and it wasn't producing results. So I told her, hey, you should probably take the afternoon off and refocus tomorrow, get really clear on what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it. And she reached out to me the next day and said at the end of the day, she had produced uh, three new prospects. Hmm, that's interesting. Kind of reminds me of like every 90 days, the quarterly meeting, a lot of people here at EOS, right? Like just stopping, reflecting, thinking, right? And then getting super clear and then getting refocused. Is that kind of similar, similar kind of an idea, right? Eh? Yeah, right. It's kind of like the the 90 day cycles, like let's go attack these things, focus on them, solve that problem, get really clear about it. And then we know how to solve the next problem. We know what what the next problem to 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 focus on is. Right. Uh, I would rather do nothing than a lot of the wrong thing. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Reminds me of a story when I first started my business. I was a member of BNI. And, uh, and I was like, I'm going to do 400 meetings before Christmas. And I started in August and, uh, and I did it, but looking back, it was like, I was not, I didn't do that first part that you talked about and really have a clear target market and be very intentional about who I was meeting with and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's important to take that step. So with all this in mind, and we don't have a lot of time today, what, what can you share that would help people to be successful? in sales kind of move. So forward. I think if I boil this down, there's, uh, there's three components that drive uh, the most success in sales, in my opinion. Uh, first is getting really clear on your ideal client profile. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into to that a, a lot deeper. The second, and I might suggest uh, the most important thing because this ties into the first one, realizing that sales is, is, is not about you or your expertise. Uh, it's about the, the prospects and, and them and, uh, and, and having them at the center of everything, right? Uh, and the last thing is actually having a strategy, uh, and, and I'll, 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 I'll qualify that, right? Because the, the, and, and we'll get into that because you know, when you, uh, when you actually have a strategy, you know what to do and what not to do. Uh, and you know, uh, what you're going to do, why you're going to do it and how you're going to do it. Right. Uh, like in your story, I was going to, you know, meet with 400 people, right. That was just a goal of meeting 400 people. What am I going to do? I don't know. I'll probably share with them what I do. Why am I going to do that? Um, just cause I got to meet a lot of people, right. That's not a well-formed strategy. Right. No. Uh, and, and how did you experience that? Just lots of activity and that was it? Yeah, it was exhausting and um, never got the results that I wanted. You know, now I probably, like you said, I probably do a lot less meetings, but I get way, way, way better results. Ah, uh, you do. You produce more with less. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's the goal, right? Uh, the goal is how can I produce more? with less effort. All right. And, and, you know, part of that, I was talking to some clients about this earlier today, S uh, me included, I, I can't say it's everybody, but a common mindset is if I'm not working a lot or I'm not uh, in action a lot, I'm not going to be able to produce results. And, uh, and I just found that to be a very inefficient approach. You know, growing up, I watched my dad work two jobs. I worked 35 hours in high school. And when I got into the professional world, 
that hustle mentality just didn't take me very far, right? Uh, uh, I'd rather only focus on doing the most effective and efficient things because I don't know about everybody uh, else here, but I uh, I got into, I, I started my business not only to make good money, but also to live a, a specific lifestyle, right? And working all the time is was not part of that, right? So, uh, so, so let's get into these three things. Uh, so the, the first is getting really clear on your ideal client profile and, um, why this is very important is because you want to be able to, uh, one, spend more time with the right people and less time with the wrong people. I had a client, Larry, who, uh, when I met him, he was closing about 10% of the proposals he was making on a monthly basis. And he was, he was an outsourced CFO. So he was, uh, he was used to making like $15,000 a month. And when I met him, he was making seven to 9,000 a month. Well, uh, in February of 2018, I met him in October of 2018. He said, Hey, I want to show you my numbers. And he was closing 70 to 80% of the proposals he was making on a monthly basis. And it's not because he was meeting with a lot more people. He actually got really clear on who his ideal client profile was. And when they came into his top of his funnel, if they didn't fit that, he pushed people out. He referred them out like, hey, you got to go talk to this person or that person. I'm not the one that uh, that actually solves that problem. And uh, and and what happened is because when he would spend time in a sales pe uh, process with the wrong people, they would make it really long. They would they would ghost him. They would uh, they would just not treat him like a peer treat him like a service provider. Uh, so he, he converted more because he, he, he spent time with the, the, the right, uh, the right people, the ideal client. So, uh, and when you do that, you can assess people better. You can use your time wisely because everybody here, uh, your biggest asset and your biggest liability is your time. So you have to use it well. And when you get clear on your ideal client profile, you can also, what comes from that is your, your messaging. You know how to talk about it, right? From, I highly suggest anybody here, when anybody, get really clear on your ideal client profile, and when anybody asks you about what you do, never explain the what, always explain the who. Because that's really what people are going to be able to, your referral network will be able to identify. Uh, and your prospects will be able to identify. Like earlier this week, I was talking to an implementer that an EOS implementer that I was introduced to. And when she asked me, hey, Brian, what is that you do? I explained the who. And I explained, hey, here's what they think. Here's what they're worried about. Here's their challenges. She's, she's like, oh, Brian, that sounds like me. Right. I became highly relevant to her in that conversation. Uh, because she wanted to know is what Brian, what Brian is, what Brian does something that can help me. And if I would explain coaching sessions and videos and accountability, it wouldn't have been as relevant uh, to her as uh, basically explaining the problems. And I know what my prospects are thinking. I know what, I know what goes through their mind. I know what, uh, uh, they experience. And that's how, once I understand that, then I develop messaging out of that. So people can actually resonate with it. Um, and I think that's important because what your mind's going to, what your mind's also going to say is you got to go wide and, and capture as many people as possible, uh, with your ideal client profile. And based on my experience over the past almost decade of doing this and helping people, that's actually the slowest way to get to success. If actually even hitting that destination, right? Uh, you go narrow and clear to go wide uh, uh, because this is about speed of sale, right? The, the more clear you can be uh, with your network about this, the more clear you can be it uh, and, and speak about it in front of a uh, a prospect, the, the faster you get referrals and the faster prospects, uh, ultimately say, uh, ultimately say yes. And on top of this, something I'm inferring is you have to understand who it is and who it isn't, 
right? I, clarity is not one side of the coin. It's both sides of the coin. You need a filter uh, to go, it doesn't fit here and it looks like that. So, so it's a no, uh, because what your mind will do, it will try to take every single person that you cross and fit it into the ideal client. And, and I don't know, uh, Clayton, when you, uh, when you're with somebody who, and maybe this never happened and that's okay. When you are somebody who's not an ideal client, is it a, does it take time, energy, and resources out of you? Uh, no, you know, it's, uh, it's fine. Cause it's usually an opportunity to refer someone else, you know, but, I, but it's, it's great for me that, that I know who I target and who I can help because it, it helps me eliminate people quicker. Right. And then know how to deal with it. Okay. Different question. Um, uh, yeah. Have you ever worked with somebody who's not an ideal client? Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So how was that experience? Yeah, that's hard. Right. It's a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. It's a lot of work there. It's look, they weren't bad people. They just weren't ideal. Like somebody else can help them solve the way the problems that they have. Right. S staying in your lane gives you energy, uh, uh, gives you the ability to go. I can't wait to show up to this meeting with this client versus the opposite. Like, oh, gosh, like. I don't want to go like, like uh, you, if you're built, if you're trying to build a business and a lifestyle that should never go through your brain. Like, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm going to go to the, I don't want to show up to this meeting. Right. Uh, and, and it's very possible. It's very, very possible. Right. Uh, it, it may seem hard to, uh, based on your business right now, you may think, how can I do that? Uh, but there's more than enough business to go around. You've just been accepting non-ideal clients into your world and you're you're getting what you put up with right yeah and the uh, other thing i'll add too that i found it interesting the more specific i get in my niche and who i serve the easier it is to have referral partners because exactly. i have this very narrow niche and then i can refer to a lot of other people right but when i was more broad it was very hard to collaborate so that's one of the things that I really appreciate about it, how I've niched down more and more is that it's opened up a lot of opportunities to collaborate. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you, if, if that if that's what it did. And, and it's isn't it mm -hmm. interesting, but your mind probably said, no, no, don't go down this path. It's not going to create a lot of opportunities in the beginning, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. well, at the start, it was 400 people. I didn't really have an, an ICP. It was just kind of like whatever. I serve whoever with whatever, and that's why it didn't work. Right. I had to get I bet I bet those people had a hard time helping you because they they really weren't clear on uh yeah. on who who actually to refer to you, right? Uh you know, in, in, if it if the, there's a distinction between like, for example, uh, well, I work with manufacturing companies, right? Uh, or I work with manufacturing companies that experience this, this, and this, and the business owner's trying to go here, right? Getting really specific about it. Um, like I have a uh, an integrator client who uh, basically only wants to work with a uh, hundred percent virtual teams that work asynchronously, asynchronously, right? So it's I'm like when I find one, when I see one of those, I know exactly where it is, and and he knows all the problems that those people have, right? They're different than a you know uh, a fifty employee manufacturing company where everybody comes to the office, right? They don't experience some of those things. Yeah. Right. So, so when you get really clear on this and, and you kind of implied this, you didn't say this, I heard in what you were saying, um, when you get clear in your ideal client profile, you, it, it actually delivers you the messaging on how to talk about it. Um, and then it actually helps you uh, develop an action plan because you know where to go to find those people. I was just talking to somebody and we were talking about this is like, how do I find my, um, uh, more business owners and uh, the people I'm talking to because I'm spending time in room with peers. And I said, start with the end in mind, right? Who is it that uh, your ideal client profile, where would they go to, to find, uh, spend time in rooms or find help? Uh, and then who else are they uh, hanging out with or who do they advise and go find those people, 
right? And he and uh, who I was with was like, oh, uh, I can go here, here, and here. Okay, perfect, right? Like it, the answer was was uh, was right there once we thought through it, uh, because your action plan should be tied to your uh, ideal client profile. Uh, it. Because what happens is you get an action plan, like and I'm going to pick on you, Clayton, uh, the, you get an action plan of BNI and 400 people. Uh, that's a, that's, that's a, uh, that's a not very good action plan, right? That's, it didn't produce results, right? You need to know I'm going here because of this and this and this, right? I'm going here because uh, I know, well, here, I'll, 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 I'll tell you a story. So I, uh, I used to have a, a shared office space in 2018. I had an office and they had a main room. And in that main room, uh, they would do some networking meetings, right? So when I first started, uh, when I first bought the office there, I would go and to these networking meetings and I went to two of them. And after the first one, I was like, ah, none of these people are really my ideal client profile. And when I talk to them, they're not really selling to my ideal client profile. They were home and auto, uh, personal home and auto insurance agents, uh, wealth advisors uh, for just, you know, uh, newly formed families and, and stuff like that. And that's not who I work with. So after the second meeting, I stopped going. They weren't, not they weren't bad people. It was like, ah, that's just not a good use of my time. Well, there was a bookkeeper that I was, uh, I knew that would keep going. And after about four or five more meetings, he knocked on my door and he said, Hey, Brian, so uh, I noticed you're not coming. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, why? And I said what I just said, my ideal client profile is not there and they're not selling. And I turned the tables on him. I said, Hey, so uh, are your ideal clients there? And he's like, no, no, none of those people. No. Are, are those people able to refer you? And he goes, no. Uh -uh. I'm like, so why are you going? And he said, well, maybe someday they'll refer me. And I didn't say this to him, but hope is not a strategy. Hope, like maybe possibly someday somebody in that room will, will refer me. In my world, is not a good use of time. The faster I can notice I'm in the wrong place uh, and change, the better, right? Because again, your biggest asset and your biggest liability is your time, plain and simple. Right. So uh, the next thing is um, realize that sales is not about you or your expertise. As much as I, I, I was just talking to um, a, a, somebody who's uh, been in 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 my industry for 20 years and uh, and we were talking about this, that um, your clients and prospects expect you to have the expertise. That's like table stakes, right? You want to be sitting in front of them if they didn't think that you had the expertise. They want to understand that you understand them and what's going on in their business, how it's affecting them, and uh, and 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 what outcomes you've been able to produce based on those situations. Um, uh, it, Prospects never buy the thing that you sell. They always, 100% of the time, buy the help that they need. Those are two distinct different things, right? Uh, and, and, and making the prospect at the, at the center of everything, right? Like in my sales conversations, it's, it's 90, 10, 80, 20 talking. Like my brain right now, because I live by that principle, my brain right now uh, is basically telling me to shut up, right? Because talking this much is actually against principles, but it's how this format works, right? Uh, and uh, and that was a good question. What was that question? Uh, I saw it pop oh, up. I was just saying that they buy the solution to their problem is another way Correct. to phrase what you're saying. Correct. hundred percent, Josh. Yep. Uh, the, the, they're, they're one in the, they're one in the same thing, right? Uh, you, what you do is a means to an end to that. Right. Uh, and, and, and you're selling outcomes, not, not your time. Right. Uh, if, if, 
yeah, you're, you're focused on the wrong thing, right? Uh, uh, so you need to make the prospect at the center uh, of, of, uh, of everything. So you have to be an expert of knowing your clients and their world. Um, and this comes from the ideal client profile right? Like it, 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 these things are all connected, right? It, it builds on top of each other. Um, I've got a client, Matt, who is a Lean Six Sigma um, operational excellence uh, consultant. He worked at Motorola implementing these strategies and decided to start his own business. And he said to me, uh, Brian, uh, like I refer you my peers who I know, they, they never accept your help and they all eventually uh, go back to corporate America. And he's like, I don't understand. Like, what is it? What is it? And I said, man, it's two things. Uh, he, he, when he said, what is it? He's like, what, what is it about me versus them? Like, because I'm making it, right? Uh, uh, he's got a, almost a $2 million business. And uh, I said, you know, you, you, you focus on two things. One, sales is not about you. It's about your, your prospects and your clients. You, you center it around them. And two, you work on yourself as much as you work on your business. And, and as he grows, so does his business, mm -hmm. right? Because this is, I, I was talking to somebody the other day. I forget who it was. Uh, I, it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, she's a packaging design consultant in Minneapolis. And she said, Brian, a year ago, I did not show, I did not realize I was, uh, I was signing up for a personal growth journey. I thought I was starting a business and I was like, spot on, right? This is about, um, uh, you know, who you are becoming and how you're showing up, uh, you know, in the world. Uh, and, and part of that is shifting, uh, your focus from you and your expertise, because your brain wants to focus on that to them. Because, all right, Clayton, what's the number one thing people like to uh, talk about, Clayton? Themselves. Boom. Okay, this is not a trick question. What's the number one thing people like to think about when they're not talking about themselves? <laughs> Probably the same. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, so if we, if I know, if you know this principle, Clayton, if you know this principle, right? This is just the human condition, uh, just the human condition, right? There's this is how we're made, right? It's a survival technique. If you know that principle, um, how would you handle prospect meetings when somebody? Yeah, how would you handle prospect meetings? Would you would you talk about your expertise and go on and on about it? Ask questions. Yes, right. You flip the tables. Uh, because you got about seven seconds before somebody stops listening. Uh, here's another story. Uh, the um, I uh, I sat with the president of uh, an insurance uh, brokerage here in in Chicago. They also do uh, handle four hundred one ks. And uh, my partner, and I went in there because he was interested in like, hey, I want to. Uh, I'm always open to hearing about your approach. See if it can see if it can help us. Um, uh, it's a pretty big brokerage. I think they have like 300 employees. Um, and we were talking about bad sales behavior. And he said, Brian, it just, it blows my mind. He said, we were switching our 401k platform, uh, the technology. And I had a, a, a meeting with a company. He didn't name, name and names that doesn't actually matter where uh, the, a girl came in with her boss and he said, here's what I want to talk about bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. And she goes, perfect. We'll get to that. And he said, she took her computer out, turned it around, started a 45 minute PowerPoint presentation. And he said, when they left, uh, I was like, Hey, thanks for coming. He said, I bet they thought that was a great meeting. And he said, I stopped listening after three minutes <laughs> because, and he, and he literally like, he, he basically said, Hey, if you talk about these three things, that's going to be relevant to me. And she set it aside, right? Because he didn't want to talk about them. He wanted to talk about him. Right. So when you focus your, your, like you said, asking questions in sales conversations, making them the center of it, right. Being the curiosity questions and listening 
are the three most powerful sales skills in the world. And they're not even sales skills. I mean, right? It's, it's communication skills, right? When you get when you get interested in other people, you become interesting to them, right? It, it, uh, you get attractive, right? Because when you understand their problems, how it's affecting them, uh, how it's, uh, you know, causing them issues or keeping them from their goals and finding out what the goals are, uh, they're basically uh, uh, sh telling you what to talk about. That's one thing is it, you said questions. I start off with questions in prospect uh, conversations because I'm trying to fish for what to talk about because the prospect will tell you exactly what to offer them and how to offer it to them as long as you're listening and asking questions, right? Uh, because uh, everybody, everybody wants to be heard and understood. It's on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And the world that we live in, People just scream louder, but nobody listens to each other. So when you, sh so let, let's take, for instance, a prospect expects you to be an expert at what you do, right? So you come to the table, you're an expert at what you do. If you're the person that doesn't talk about how awesome they are as the, the expert, and you talk about them, you stick out versus the competition. You become relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And and uh, what, what was it? Maybe Maya Angelou said this. It's not what you say that people remember. It's how you make them feel that matters and makes them remember, right? This is the experience you give prospects, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, 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 you said in the beginning, you... Uh, you you appreciated my approach, but my from my reaction of interacting with you in that comment, it's about how he made you feel, yeah. right? Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah, I just feel I think I I've always just felt comfortable with you because Bam. you know, you ask questions and you seem to care, right? Whereas you know like you, well we've all I'm sure we've all experienced the the LinkedIn pitch slap, right? Where someone, you know, tries to sell you on the first call or, you know, you or the networking meeting where it's like obvious that this person just doesn't really care. They just want to sell you, right? Uh, that's, that's probably more the norm than what we're talking about here today. So you can yeah. differentiate yourself by just asking questions, right? Yep. Uh, and a couple of things on that. Uh, I'm going to name them so I, I remember them is uh, is detached from the outcome, mm -hmm. right? And no, as a seller, you saying no to a prospect always has to be an option. So mm -hmm. the first thing, and I'll qualify this one, detach from the outcome. What I'm not saying is is to not prepare, right? I'm, I'm I am saying prepare. What I'm saying is when that meeting starts detach from the outcome of them having to say yes because people will say what Clayton just said I I you didn't uh you felt comfortable I didn't feel pressured right uh they have uh agency in that conversation and uh and for the right buyers they're motivated and then they move they'll move on their own you don't got to pull them right mm -hmm. uh yeah. and when you detach from the outcome you get less nervous you put less pressure on yourself and you stop the voice in your head that's getting in the way of, of uh, what do I have to say next or, or what, right? Uh, if you're really good at what you do and you're asking questions about what's going on with them, your expertise knows what questions to ask them. You're problem solving. You're basically doing what you do when, in, uh, if you were actually serving that client, but you're just doing it in the sales process, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, just take that like, and, and move it closer, move it to the sales process. Right. And people will understand uh, that, Oh, you're an expert at what you do. You know what you're talking about. Um, and it feels, it feels uh, uh, good to them. Uh, and shoot, I just almost, uh, so it was detaching from the outcome. What was the other thing? I can't believe I forgot that. Uh, 
I don't think he said that, so I don't know. <laughs> um, we want to say no. Thank you, Michael. Glad you're here today. <laughs> you're my savior. So be willing to say no, meaning um, uh, where I see people fail is the fact that they go into every sales conversation with the only outcome being yes. Like if I don't get them to buy, then I failed. And, and again, this is going back to your ideal client profile, right? If I'm clear about my ideal client profile and somebody doesn't fit that, hey, it's like, hey, I don't think we're a fit, right? Like, hey, you want to solve the problem in a way that I don't solve it, right? Uh, or you don't need a, a COO, you actually need a CFO, right? Um, and and actually, the what happens is when you when you come to the table of like, hey, I may just um, let's say I'm qualifying this person as much as they're qualifying me, it creates an environment where the other person feels safe that they can tell you the truth. They're not going to hide behind things, right? And when you when you create a, an environment of, of, of safety and transparency, people will, will dump on you. They will tell you everything, right? And that's how a good, that's a good relationship, right? Uh, starting it from the start. Like for instance, uh, I got a, I got a prospecting email to my inbox earlier today and the, the message started with, Hey Brian, I wanted to follow up to our conversation that we had, uh, earlier this month. And I never had a conversation with that person that it was like, it, it was clearly a mass email. And I'm like, so starting off the relationship with a lie is your strategy, right? Like that just kind of, uh, uh, blows my mind. Right. Uh, uh, I, I I don't understand why those sales tactics are taught, right? Uh, I'll just tell a quick story for the fractionals in the room. You know, I, I know one of the questions that I always like to ask potential clients when I'm meeting with them is, why do you think you need a fractional and not full-time? Boom. Right? And that that shows that I want what's best for them, right? Because it's it's no good for me to sell them fractional work when what they need is full-time, right? And yep. I've had multiple situations where in the course of a conversation, it's like, you know what? I don't think I'm the right person to help you. I think you need a full-time person because of this, 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 and this, right? And, you know, part of me in my mind is thinking, why are you saying that? <laughs> right? Like, you're just talking them out, right, of working with you. But the reason I am is because it's what's best for them, right? And, and guess what? Yes. That person's more likely to refer you right in the future for a fractional you know role that comes along so it's like the the long game like these people that are saying you know following up on that conversation they're not playing the long game they're just playing a numbers game right whereas what i want to do is play the long game i want to do what's right right i want to build relationships oh and and i might suggest that not every one of those turn out that way right there there are there are lots that that say, no, no, this is why, and, and here's reasons why I need fractional. And uh, you just establish yourself as an objective person that actually is interested in helping them, right? The, the I want to state this right, the, the behavior of not selling is the thing that sold it. It's like, what? Like, uh, uh, it, it, the, the mind works backwards. The, it, like a lot of people don't want to be pushy. And what you just described was the opposite of pushy of which got the opportunity, right? Because people are dying to interact. Buyers are dying to interact with sellers that are not pushy, that are objective, that want to understand them. It builds trust from, from the beginning, Right. And when you, when when uh, when you can create an environment where someone makes an assessment that you're just there to help them, and you're not there to sell them, I might suggest if if they're if they're motivated to solve their problem, they will work with you, right? Because they feel like they have agency and uh, uh, and they're in control, right? You just created that uh, that environment. Right. Uh, that's why uh, I think I said this earlier on the fact that uh, 
everybody here, I believe, was not a salesperson prior to this, like you're, you actually define yourself as not a salesperson is actually one of the biggest advantages you have. It's many people I cross take that as a detriment and it's not right. The, uh, one of the reasons why I don't work with traditional salespeople is because I have to unwind all this behavior, right? Uh, it's, it's fascinating, right? Uh, so realize that if you are, if you consider yourself not a salesperson, that is actually an advantage. And, and Clayton, when you're working with a client and, uh, you know, you're doing your thing, you're, you're being objective the whole time, right? Yeah. Have to be right. Right. So, so again, I, I, I asked you that as an illustration, take the skills that you have serving clients and bring it into the sales process, right? Start, uh, I'm on a mission to help change the narrative from selling to serving, because when you serve people from the beginning, um, uh, you win more, right? People will fall over trying to, trying to work with you, right? Um, it's just, I, I've just seen it happen so many times. So I, I see we're running out of time. Let me, let me get to the last thing. Uh, I could talk for, for days about this. So, um, actually have a strategy kind of like you said clean it's like ah like you had an you had an action plan of meeting with 400 people but you didn't have a strategy um layered over top of it you have to know why you're doing things why you wouldn't do something um and and basically point to the actions and the things you're doing saying oh here's why i'm doing that kind of like the um uh where i i stopped going to that uh that networking meeting, because I, I could go like, oh, um, I'm trying to be in rooms of my ideal client profile or uh, people that are selling my ideal client profile. Nobody in this room uh, fits that bucket. I'm going to stop doing that, right? This is about as much as what you don't do as much as what you do do, right? Um, and, uh, and, and going back to the ideal client profile, uh, when you get really clear on that, it not only helps your messaging, it also helps you start forming an action plan because, you know, like I said, start with the end in mind. Uh, you're you're figuring out, hey, where do these people go? Uh, uh, where do they hang out with? Who do they trust? And you find uh, you find those places. It also tells you who to network with and who not to network with. And uh, and I want to share one thing about this, maybe it's two, is um, the language I've been using recently is who are the witnesses to your ideal client profiles, uh, uh, the situations where uh, they know to refer you, and also think about power witnesses, meaning people that are crossing your uh, ideal client profile in higher speed. Uh, here, here's an example. Um, I did a, a webinar like this with Chris Beer, uh, and uh, there was an integrator uh, in the audience that was part of a, she was the integrator for a fractional CMO business. And, and, uh, and out of that webinar, uh, she asked me to come do something like this for, for their group. When I was in, uh, in that group, uh, somebody in that group was putting on a fractional executive conference and asked me to come speak there. Right. So, uh, my power witness are people who put on conferences that are focused on fractional executives. So I got to talk in front of 192 prospects, right? So I'll go find people that are running groups of fractional executives, right? Those are power witnesses at they're passing my prospects at high speed. We all have them. You just have to take time to think about it. Um, you also have to X out the people that you shouldn't be networking with. That's as, as important of, uh, of uh, who you should and who you shouldn't, right? Because the, uh, the, the, the faster you get to the right places, the faster your, uh, your business, you know, grows. Um, and, and if you're not producing uh, leads, right, I hear that a lot, uh, you may not have a lead problem. You most likely have a strategy problem, right? Because uh, basically um, 
just generating more leads doesn't mean you're you're doing it effective. Like for instance, uh, I, I actually help clients unwind lead generation programs all the time because when we start taking a look at the program, the lead generation company is just getting people in front of them that can um, fog a mirror. They're not qualified prospects, right? right? Uh, it's about qualified people, right? So if you're uh, if you're not generating leads, look at who you're hanging out with, uh, referral network, look at the places you're going, or two, ask yourself, do I really have a strategy, right? You may not have a strategy uh, because once you figure out the strategy, then you'll be able to actually execute on it and, and know, you know why, you're, why you're doing it, right? Because uh, as all these things you know, are connected, and I'll go back to the, the clarity, confidence, action, right? Um, if your actions aren't producing the results, it's probably because you're not that confident. And if you're not that confident, it's probably because you're not that clear. Uh, and any anytime I've asked, I, I'm talking to somebody and they say, hey, I need more leads. I say, well, explain to me your strategy. I get either, oh, well, I really don't have one, or I get a, a, a challenging explanation. I'm like, okay, we're not going to start producing leads. We're going to start producing a better strategy because that's going to produce the leads for us. Um, and, a, and, a, and a strategy helps you focus, right? Focus is key. Uh, I can't, I'm going to keep going back to this 400 thing. Uh, it's like that 400 people didn't allow you to focus, did it, Clayton? No, I didn't know I was going to become a case study, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch out you bring up next time. <laughs> you were just you were just easy pickings. So um but but it, again in in a wrap up, um three things to really focus on uh and and start mastering. One, get really clear on your ideal client profile. Um, you know, if if you've got a if you're an implementer or integrator, go past the 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 two or excuse me, the 10 to 250. Go deeper than that, right? Find your kind of lane inside of that, kind of like you were saying, Clayton, where you can still hang out with other integrators and implementers, but hey, this is the lane I'm in. Anytime you find somebody uh, and they'll be able to identify it. it. The principle is when you get clear ideal client profile, um, it's like this. Um, it's the same principle. Uh, Clayton, the last time you bought a car, did you see it everywhere? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But before that, all you did was see a sea of cars, right? That's what this work. That, that's that's exactly how this works is you and other people will be able to see it when when you develop your ideal client profile. Second thing is realize sales is is not about you. Uh, I, what did you say about the LinkedIn pitch? You, you used the uh, pitch slap, the, the pitch slap. A buddy of mine, uh, uh, Ty, Tyron calls it the value vomit. Right. Like, uh, you know, don't value vomit on on prospects, uh, ask questions and listen, make it all about them. And they will tell you exactly what to offer them and how to offer to them. And lastly is actually have a strategy. If you're struggling, you're not producing results. Ask yourself an honest question. Hey, do I actually have a strategy or am I just out there kind of, you know, just taking action every day? Right. Because if you're just taking action and you can't define and say, here's why I'm doing it, here's how I'm doing it, and and uh and here's the direction I'm going in, um you're you're gonna you're gonna struggle longer, right? You you may hit success. I'm not gonna say you won't, you may hit success, right? It's just gonna take you take you longer, right? And it's gonna be very uncomfortable. Yeah. Awesome, Brian. Thank you. We'll we'll have a few minutes here just for for QA if anybody has any questions uh i think it's fine to just unmute and and say it uh in the group if you have one or if you're not comfortable you can put it in the chat as well whatever works i don't know if there were any questions in the chat i wasn't uh i wasn't watching it i, I was i don't think there was any questions other than um josh's any questions anybody has oh so um we'll uh we're definitely going to get everybody uh, out of here on time. Um, what I would like to say is um, outside of thank you for everybody coming and, and, and spending time. I know you could have been doing something else on uh, the 29th. Uh, 
Clayton and I are going to be uh, doing another session and uh, he's going to be talking about his expertise. I mean, he's really great working with visionaries and uh, and integrators and, and leadership teams and, and building those relationships. Because what I know to be true is that those uh, making those relationships work in a business are directly proportionate uh, or directly tied to the success of that business. So can you can you share more about that on the 29th, Clayton? Yeah, so the 29th is really going to be um, prepared for the integrator who is frustrated with their relationship with their visionary. Uh, and the reason, the reason I want to share about that is because that was the first seven years of my life working with the visionary I had. Uh, a very challenging start working with visionaries. And I, I learned a lot. And I've over the years just recognized that this is a very common issue. And uh, so, so really it's, it's gonna be about what can an integrator second in command do to improve their relationship with the visionary, even if the visionary isn't really um, aware that there's an issue or doesn't wanna come to the table to work on that issue. Uh, so there's some coaching that I've done with other people that has been really effective. So I'm gonna share. Um, those things uh, within that webinar. Yes, we'll be we'll be sending uh, uh, some info about uh, that out again, uh, or or uh, or later, so you can sign that up. Uh, Clayton will be sending it out. Uh, I'll be sending it out too. And uh, and what I would say is, if if anybody here is is looking for help, um, uh, I'd be willing to to spend uh, sixty minutes with you, kind of working through things. Um, uh, I'm actually. Uh, putting together a program where um, I'm capping it at eight people. We're, we're, we're going to work together for five months. Uh, uh, and if you want to take a, a look at, you know, getting one-one -on -one coaching or being part of that uh, five-month program, I'm putting a uh, uh, a link in the chat. Whoops. Why? Oh, hold on. And uh, you can book uh, 60 minutes with me. It's a working session, right? I'm going to help you, uh, solve problems, think through things. That, uh, and all I ask is if, if, if you're, if you're not really seriously looking for help, if you're just looking for a free coaching session, please allow the people who um, are looking for help to, to book on that because I work through problems with people. I give them the answers. I give you some strategies and tactics for you to make an assessment. Is this the help that I'm looking for, right? And if it is, we talk about um, partnering together. If not, that's perfectly fine uh, with me. But um, I mean, Clayton and I have done this where uh, I gave him some things that he can use. And and uh, I mean, can you talk a little bit about that, Clayton? Um, sorry, I'll put I, you on the spot. I was just reading a, a question that came up in the chat. Sorry, I wasn't really listening. <laughs> uh, oh, was Darren. Yeah, Darren just put a question. Could you tell us a little bit about how you typically structure one-on-one -on -one engagements, partnerships with the fractionals? With fractionals. Uh, Darren, ask that. Uh, rephrase that question. I, I'm not. Yeah. So like if uh, let's say we start schedule a 60 minute session, and we want to continue with some sort of a coaching relationship or engagement oh, yeah. where we hire you. What does that, what does that look like? Yep. So um, the, the five month program is uh, we meet uh, twice a month for 90 minutes as a, uh, as a group. Uh, and I cap the number of people uh, uh, and you have access to me through uh uh, we use something like um, Slack or some other uh, communication tool in between as a as a group. So it's not just those sessions. It's uh, um, uh, it's it's also access to me in other ways to ask questions, ask the group questions. Uh, and for the one to one coaching, I, I meet with you once a week for an hour uh, uh, and, and I do that month to month. And then you have access to me by phone and email outside of that. Uh, and, and what we do is we pick a. Uh, we get really clear on one of the reasons why I do the 60 minute sessions is we get really clear on uh, what we're going to work on, why we're going to work on it, and how we're going to work on it. Right. So you have an idea of, Hey, this is the help Brian provides and here's how it's going to work because um, my business is, is my business success is only successful. If you're successful that, uh, and if you and uh, I've worked with a a lot of people, you can go to my LinkedIn profile and look at the recommendations. Uh, there's a, a lot of people that I've taken time to put on there about the work that I've done with them and the results that they they produced. So um, so you can definitely uh, you know look there. But um, 
uh, I mean, there, there, there's definitely more to that. We're running out of time, but that's kind of the basic highlight. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for this, guys. This is great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I appreciate everybody uh, coming. And uh, Clayton, are, are you going to share here this stuff for the 29th or you just? Yeah, I, I dropped the link in the chat. Uh, I'll drop it again here if anybody missed it. Uh, oh, wait, I got to find it here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to join, I'll be, you can follow me too on LinkedIn. I'll be posting about it there as well, but there's the link. And what was the, did you want me to answer that question that you asked me that I didn't hear? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So when we met, uh, you got actionable things that you could take and do and strategies. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's one of the keys to all of this is just adding value a yeah. lot right wow. like every interaction right that's one thing i learned years ago that really helped me after the bni 400 <laughs> you know was just you know add value all the time everywhere so every conversation that you're in you know ask questions look for ways that you can help whether it's an introduction whether it's a book recommendation you know a nugget of wisdom that you've learned right and i've built some pretty amazing relationships over the years just by just by doing that. And sometimes it results in referrals and sometimes it doesn't, but I don't concern myself with that. Really, it's I'm here to help and add value. And, and I believe that it comes back to you if you do that. Yeah, hundred percent. So, well, Clayton, I appreciate it. This was great. I appreciate you yeah, taking time and helping put this together. And I appreciate everybody else. Like uh, like I said, you, you could have chose to do something else and, and you spent time with us. So uh, I know I know we both appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everybody. Cool. Absolutely. Thanks everybody.